Hi, it's uh, lovely to be here with you. Um, until our esteemed producer, Sue, gets this new MacBook Pro. Uh, we don't have music, but next year we're going to have loads. Um, so I was going to sing for you, <laughs> but I think I won't. And instead, let's go into what we're doing here today. Well, first of all, it feels to me, well, I know, so I'm sure it feels to you too, it's obvious that we need to congregate. It's just a human need. Um, I'll say, I think I was saying this in an email, that the, the, uh, you know, on a biological level, we need the human warmth, the reassurance of, of movement of other people, just to kind of get a reference point, of course. But, um, you know, we also need to, to congregate to celebrate life and hence the party and, and so on. And yet there's also always been the need for us to come together in some kind of honour of the ineffable presence that makes itself into all of this. <laughs> and I, I'd like to state right from the beginning that when I talk about this presence, it's, it's a very different concept to when we tend to think of a god or a divine being or a creator of, of the universe because the way the Taoists put it is that this whole thing is a web that has no weaver. It's a web that weaves itself. So th th there's not actually like a creator and the created. It's just there's the created that creates itself. It's, this is the Tao. And uh, a good friend of mine is reading um, Fritjof Capra's book, The Tao of Physics, at the moment. He was a, a man I was very privileged to know because he was a good friend of R.D. Lang back in the 70s. I, I met him. And, um, genius, that's a genius, and he wrote this book, The Tao of Physics, which is a precursor to all the kind of um, the, the, the the convergence of, of of quantum physics and and cosmology that we're uh, privileged to be witnessing now. And uh, I'd forgotten the book, um, really, what was in it. And she was reminding me how um, he talks about that the everything, or what um, the Gnostics called the pleroma. Um, is a void, but the the Taoists always call it the void that is not empty, and um, it's a place you can go to inside the middle of your brain. In fact, um, and it's the same. They talk about the, the 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 void that is not empty when you bring your mind right into the back of your head and you just gaze into the the void that you see in front of you, but it's a void that is not empty. And why it's not empty is because it is comprised of chi. Now, chi is energy. Um, and we tend to, I, I think we kind of underplay the the miracle of energy. Uh, everything in the universe is energy. And we can't, I mean, I don't know about you, but there's a sentence that's going, yeah, yeah, energy, energy. Um, but it's a phenomenon. I mean, it's an, a, an, an inexplicable phenomenon. And the way the Taoists put it, um, it would at least my translation of the way they put it, is that the the Tao manifesting itself as all of this does so through Qi. It's like the, the, the Qi is the Tao in motion. Without the Qi, there is, there is nothing. It just, just remains in the undifferentiated absolute state. But as it moves, as it kind of creates uh, itself as all of this, it's chi that does that. So you could say, in a way, that chi is the the Tao with clothes on. Um, even more so when it when it turns into matter. I just would like to say that there is this horrible glitchy sound going on in my ear, and I don't know if that's to do with any specialties or anything um, anywhere um, up north of England. But if it is, and there's anything you can do about it, it would be beautiful. If not, I'll carry on with that um, and pretend it's a nice percussion sound. Um, the uh, the matter when it when it kind of it, us in other words all of this that we're aware of is according to Frischoff Capra is a glitch in the chi. Um, it's a very beautiful way of looking at it. So in the free flow of the energy comes this kind of glitch, this interference, and it's that interference that causes the physical manifest universe. So it's a very interesting idea, a notion that this whole universe is a glitch. In the, in the energy flow, in the, in the universal energy flow. Um, and we have always had a need to congregate to, however clumsily or 
however much we have to use hocus pocus or or ritual or or all the other nonsense people use um however we do it we need to come together to somehow acknowledge that we are manifestations of this we are the manifestations in human form of this ineffable presence um Tao, whatever you want to call it and um that we somehow are able to acknowledge that we are that in ourselves as individuals and therefore that everyone else is that as well so when we congregate we're honoring the Tao in each other and why we need to do that i actually don't know but it seems to be primordial this this requirement um, this this urge this drive to to, to meet like this and um, what's very exciting uh, for me um, is that well I'm sure for everybody really is this technology which although it has its dark face has an amazing bright face as well it's a, a bringer of much beauty and light um, in this instance for example here we are you know we're, we're 200 of us all the way around the planet meeting together without the need for posturing or masks or use of personality or uh, the need to impress each other or parade in any way whatsoever or there's no fear of judgment nobody cares what shoes you're wearing what you know what, how you dress what your hair looks like it's a beautiful privilege to be able to meet almost as disembodied spirits um, it's incredibly freeing perhaps even more so than if we were to do it in in person and um, the, the reason that I called it sasang way back whenever it was about three years ago so um, I actually can't really remember why I chose that word. It's just this, I've always liked it. I've always been into the whole Hindu thing. I've always, uh, I've always practiced yoga. I do a little bit of it these days every day along with my other stuff. But um, I've been to many gurus in India and elsewhere, and, I, and I've always loved that satsang thing, which means we come together and sit in truth. And um, not that I would ever have uh, pretensions to consider myself a guru, even though they often call that, but I think that's just lazy journalism and what have you, and even on my, my part, sometimes describe myself as guru, you know, you can be a design guru now, or a business guru now, it doesn't, it just means teacher really, or somebody who talks about the thing, um, but in the, in the traditional sense of the Indian guru, because gurus have disciples, gurus uh, take on the karma of their disciples, and it's quite an involved kind of dynamic, well I'm not of that persuasion, I'm teaching Taoism and Taoism in its very nature is about following your own Tao, your own flow, you know, trusting your own thrust in other words. And um, therefore the idea of disciples and all that stuff is to me anathema. Uh, you know, we, we are all absolutely on the level here and I have this incredible privilege in this instance of being the facilitator of this event. And thank you for that. Um, but we, we we come together therefore in in truth without the bullshit that we generally tend to uh, uh, indulge in or succumb to in in daily life or even on daily life and the, the theme of this is confidence and um, confidence is one of my most it's one of my most uh, favorite. I hate saying favorite because I don't really have favorites, but I love this subject. I love the whole issue of confidence because um, in myself, watching me go through all my processes since I was a kid, confidence has been right at the nub of it in, in such a poignant way. Um, you know, all those times where you feel shy or awkward as a teenager for example because you can't do the latest dance everyone's doing or you're not wearing the right clothes or you haven't got the look or whatever it is that teenagers are generally you know obsessed with and adults too in a different way um yeah and you have to kind of somehow find your inner confidence and rise above your awkwardness or crumble you know that's okay too you know this i've had instances of both although that one was rare i mean it's generally this rising up through the awkwardness and um, that is confidence that is required. I, for instance, this, um, I, when I was 21, uh, I did, because, you know, I've been doing martial arts since I was 11 and I was 21. It was cold. It was actually this time of the year. And I was having a sparring competition with um, a friend of mine um, and uh, did this mad roundhouse kick to his head, uh, not having warmed up properly first. And I pulled my lower back at the sacroiliac joint quite severely. I sheared it. 
and um, then had the madness to go for a six mile run. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. And then uh, shifted loads of heavy boxes and the combination of that uh, set up a sort of a residual tendency every now and again for there to be um, a problem with the sacroiliac uh, region and it'll come on, it's come on at odd times. Sometimes, you know, in the early days it was through doing an obvious silly movement, but you know, more recently it would come on for no apparent reason. I couldn't really see where it was coming from. So fr Friday, I think it was, I was showing a friend of mine a bit of Tai Chi and um, just making a very familiar movement, suddenly I felt it coming on and it's like, oh no, not that again, oh no, oh no, oh no. Now, what's interesting with that is, is that I can, dive, I have in the past diverted it before it's got bad and then fine, it goes away, miracle, beautiful, and I'm off the hook that time. The, but this time it quite quickly got really severe and it's a, it's a disc problem. And normally in the past when it's got that severe, it's gone into a pattern where I've had to go four days of allowing it to lock right up and there's nothing I can do about it. And I just have to go with it, surrender to it, and then go to this guy called Dr. Vice in Paddington, who I've flown to from a B3 to see, because there's no one in the world that does it like Dr. Vice. He is, as he sounds, a huge human vice. And he just bangs it back into place again. But you can't do that too quick, because it just won't move if, if you try and do it too fast. And in the process, uh, you know, I can even have to have a walking stick, I've had to rather, have, to have a walking stick at times. Now, never before has this happened. This time, it comes on on Friday, I let it go into the, the spasm full on, and there's a lot of oh, oh, and making silly moves and stuff like that. But in my mind, I go through the process that I've shared with you before. I love it. Rather than fight it, I love it. Now, you might think, how do you love a pain like that? What I do is, I say to the pain, hey, I love you. I love you, I love you. I do it three times, and by then I love it. And I know because it's the Tao come to tell me something. It's the Tao in me telling me something. So I don't fight it, I love it. Now I find that when I do that, miracles of healing occur. The next stage is, um, I stick a pin in it because I'm an acupuncturist, so I stick a pin in the right place and know that that just takes 24 hours to have any effect. Um, and but then knowing I'm going to have to go see Dr. Weiss on Tuesday, say you know, so rearrange all my uh, stuff I'm doing to accommodate just lying still, not being able to move much. And um, I, I focus on it with my mind, it's not very long, a few seconds, and I just dispel it with my mind. Woke up this morning and totally okay, tiny little bit of ache on the other side, but I'm all right. I'm walking straight and it's all sorted. I mean that is pretty much a miracle for me. And what made it possible was confidence. There was this moment where, oh, can I do that? Can I do that? Oh, I don't know if I've really got the power for that. And it's like a tiny voice of that. And then the bigger voice, although it wasn't a loud one, it just goes, yeah, 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 you can do that. You can do that. Trust it all. Even if it's to be crippled, trust that too. It's all right. Everything is all right. Trust it. It's all right. Now, that ability to trust life, whatever it's going to do, and, uh, you know, we all get confronted with huge things, everybody, that's part of being human, but to trust that it's okay, however horrible, and I know how horrible it can get from myself, but from other people and the stories I hear, you know, there's a really awful things go on, but to be able to trust that it's okay, that's what confidence is, it literally means, um, it comes from Latin, the word videre, to trust, and um, to, uh, con, con is with or or in, so you you trust in or you trust with the flow of events, you trust with the journey, you trust, you put your trust with the Tao, and by extension, you put your trust with yourself for being able to ride it well, um, and this is not something that generally you can just do uh, in one go, because we all understand that, I and mean, it all makes sense, if I trust myself, and I trust the journey I'm, I'm on, and I trust that however horrible something may feel initially, it's come to give me a blessing of some kind. If I can trust that, and if I can trust that dying is safe, so there's nothing to fear at any level, um, then everything seems to work much more beautifully. Things happen. Wonderful surprises occur. Blessings befall me. And... Um, this, this is obvious, but it takes time. There's a process there. There's a process in learning to trust yourself. And However, and this is where we um, 
are able to do magic and why I call these sessions magic sessions. And I don't know about you if you've been coming before, but they've certainly been working for me. Actually, I have to say, uh, um, blatantly working for me the first time in all the series for three years or whatever it's been. This is the first series that's actually worked for me. And the reason for that is, is because the others were working for everybody else. I mean, getting the feedback and I'm thinking, how come they're not working for me? They seem to be doing the opposite. They, like, everything was getting messed up. And I realized that what I'd done is some unconscious contract were a sacrifice of, of like, no, I give it all to everybody else at my expense. And it wasn't on a very subtle level. So I corrected it. And I thought, no, I give this to everybody, including me, that this magic works for me too. And I actually made a conscious point of telling myself that. And it has done. Because everything works like a mirror. If you give the intention uh, to the Tao, the Tao mirrors it back at you by making it so. Uh, I wish I could attend this horrible noise to in my ear. But anyway, I'll stop being a princess and carry on. Um, it's because I've been working on tunes and mixing and every little tiny thing. I'm thinking, oh, that's a hi-hat out of place. I need to move that. Um, what, what I, um, ha, 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 I lost myself there. Yeah, no, no, I know. What, what I think it is, is that this Taoist jumping technique um, is incredibly powerful. It's probably the most powerful magic tool, if you like, that I think I've ever stumbled across or you know ever been introduced to and um, it William the beauteous master used to, it, it sounds ridiculous but that was his name uh, in Hong Kong when I was 19 um, studying uh, Taoist magic which is what I went there for his thing was you know I tell him about this problem I had and he go oh no just jump over it no 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 just jump over it and he'd make the sign of jump over it and like pointing to me being on the other side of it. I said, what, like just jump over it? He goes, yeah, jump over it. <laughs> and and you, you train yourself to do that with your mind, even though the intellect's going, no, no, you can't just jump over a problem. That's being ridiculous. That's going into avoidance. Um, if you can let all that nonsense go and just jump over it, you're on the other side and it works. It really, really works. So when it comes to developing confidence, which I really suggest is one of the most important qualities <coughs> excuse me, that we can ever um, develop, we can actually jump over all the obstacles to having confidence and find ourselves in that place of, of, of confidence. We'll get to that in a minute. Structurally speaking, or psychostructurally speaking, um, when we're confidence, this trusting of the self at the core level, this trusting of the, of the path, the Tao, at the core level, can only really occur when you situate yourself <clears throat> in the part of you that is authentic, and that, according to the Taoist schema, is in your back. The back is still. The back doesn't move. You are relative to the front. Uh, there's no noise going on in the back. The organs are not in the back. The back is solid pretty much and protected. And it's where the strength of the body is. The Taoist martial arts, you're trained to punch or kick from the back, uh, not from the front, because the back's where the power is. And it makes sense. You're also trained to drop right back inside so that when confronted by danger, an extreme situation, rather than go forwards to meet it in your body, you drop back inside. Um, and, and you therefore find yourself in the place of strength and stillness, where there isn't the fizz, there isn't the interference, there isn't the, the noise of the drama of life. There's just stillness. And you're able to observe from there the drama going on in front of you. The drama includes not only the action out there that's visible to your, your sense organs or discernible to your sense organs, it also includes your reaction, your emotional reaction and your mental reaction to what you're perceiving as occurring, which we have to remember is purely subjective. And often really completely different to what really is occurring. Nonetheless, <clears throat> our uh, reaction to that comprises probably the majority of the drama. And all of that goes on in the front of the body. Uh, when you're in the back of your body, um, you're able to accommodate all of that. You sort of preside over it. You bear witness to it, but are no longer identified with it. And when you're in the back of you, you are one with the background presence inside of you. So if we, if we talk about the Tao as existing primarily in the undifferentiated state at the subatomic level, you could call it the background presence to everything, you know, to all manifest reality. There is this background presence, so to speak. This is the Tao. And it's in us as well. 
And it is not only figuratively, but actually in the back, hence the background presence. So as you merge with your own back, as you lean into your shoulder blades, your spine, your hip bones, and you let your mind sink into the back of the head, you are merging with the background presence. And when they're choosing to trust the path, choosing to trust this vehicle that you're in and the mind that, that, that operates it to negotiate the path optimally is natural. It's really easy. There's no problem with that at all. And that's confidence. The confidence we're more familiar with, or the, the parody of confidence we're more familiar with, is something that is attached to the front part of the being, which is the constructed self, or as Freud called it, the ego. And th this is an illusory self. It's only, uh, it's like a mask. Com mask is the um, per per personality. Personality comes from the ancient Greek persona. Um, in other words, the person, the, that which presents itself, is really just the front. And um, it's quite possibly and often is a distortion of what's behind it, a disguise. What's behind it is this background presence, which the more you merge into it, the bigger it becomes. It's this huge presence because it is the entire universe, really, and everything that informs it. So this, this front part, the person we're familiar with and others are familiar with in us, is really just the tip of the iceberg. And um, the confidence that we tend to uh, recognize is the combination of arrogance, conceit, um, mania, in terms of like the bipolar effect of being right up and full of yourself and all the rest of it, ex excitability, and being deluded into thinking that this front bit is, there, is all there is, and it's really clever because it's just managed to do this and do that, and it's really strong, and nobody takes the piss out of it, and da 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 and it's great, and it's great, and that will inevitably lead to a fall. It always does. I mean, it has to. And conversely, the fall will lead to a rise again. That's the yin and yang, which operates in manifest reality. However, that's not confidence. That's just like the roller coaster ride of like, yeah, I've got it. Yeah, I've got it. Oh, shit, I haven't got it. I haven't got it. Oh, I got it. I got it. Oh, I got it. Oh, I got it. That's, the, that's not real confidence. It's noisy. It's of the front. It's of the ego. The ego is not bad, by the way. It's just a description of the constructed self. Now, when you're in the back of you, the confidence that you have is quiet. That's why everybody always used to go on about, oh, I like that guy. He's got a lovely, quiet confidence about him. And it is, because confidence is quiet. It's discreet. It's subtle. It isn't noisy at all. It's not strident. It's insistent, but it's really, really soft and really quiet and subtle and discreet. In my first ayahuasca ceremony, uh, what I got from it, the gift I got from that one, was uh, the, this presence of the ayahuasca spirit putting this little navy blue marble-like shape, a uh, sphere, in my solar plexus and it spans spinning it and putting it into a perpetual spin um, and, this, and saying to me that that's your confidence. Now you never ever need to worry again about anything. This worrying thing is just a game and it's stupid. You don't have to play it anymore drop it. No no more worrying. It's a complete waste of time. Stop it now. And just focus on the little ball spinning. That's your confidence. We'll never let you down. And um, and it aside from the fact that coming off that mountain, literally, I also came off it figuratively and dropped into a low that I can't ever remember anything like. lasted about a day uh, of absolutely no confidence whatsoever on any level at all. I complete fall apart. And then a very quick rebuild it just happened of itself. After which, since which, rather, I, I don't know, about seven years ago, I, have no, I don't think I've really worried about anything. I've been concerned about things and had to focus on things, but I've not worried anymore, progressively less and less all the time. And this confidence um, has become a lot more steady and persistent in itself, and yet remains a really, really quiet phenomenon. It's not noisy at all. So this is what I want to share with you. I hope it, 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 what I've just said is resonating somewhat, because I'm not trying to tell you anything you don't already know, of course. Um, I'm just trying to kind of spark up resonances of what you already do know, so we find commonality. Um, now let's go into um, a meditation process and um, do our magic. Now this is to elicit what I would describe as a quantum jump 
in your levels and scope of self-confidence in, in being able to trust yourself and trust the journey that you're on. Um, that I would predict will occur within 24 hours or so of, of this session. That seems to be some strange time lag that occurs uh, before this stuff uh, starts being visible. It, it doesn't matter when it comes. It will come when it comes, but it will come. And, um, and the joy of that, which I wish you in infinite measure, um, will, will be just knowing that it's okay and then remembering really knowing that you knew this all the time. It's just that you were playing that worrying game with yourself perhaps. So take this opportunity, aware that there are 200 people around the planet with you, to settle into your body. Don't try and hold yourself up for now. Just let yourself sink. So all the weight of your head and your chest, your shoulders, which is considerable, relatively speaking, rather than try and hold it up in the air, um, let it sink down inside your body where it wants to go, fill up in your pelvis and your legs and feet and so on. Uh, close your eyes if it's appropriate for you and you feel like. And um, slow your breathing down. Stop holding your breath. Slow the breathing down. And get the feeling that somebody is lifting the back of your head upwards towards the ceiling. They're kind of pulling your head up towards the ceiling, uh, causing the back of your neck to lengthen. And um, at the same time, get the feeling that your shoulders are safe to drop. Let your shoulders drop. And as your shoulders drop, let the shoulder girdle broaden out. And as the shoulder girdle broadens out, allow the breastplate to slide upwards a little bit. And you'll notice now that you have more sense of elegance about you. you you're, there's more light in your mind. Um, you feel lighter. You've got more of an expanded arena of experience internally. And the raised breastbone is just a very subtle uh, dignity added to your being, a sense of nobility about you. Um, let your hips be broad as they want to be, so no, no need to keep the hips narrow. So you feel like you're sitting comfortably on a firm base. And with all of this going on, mentally scan down from the crown to the soles of your feet. And wherever you notice that you're gripping your muscles, just command those muscles to stop gripping. Just come on, let go, let go, it's safe, relax, relax, soften. And um, you'll notice as you do this, going down through your face, you can make your face soften so much, you can let go of all the expression, you know, all that, that mask really, um, which we all use to face the world. Um, it's, it's, again, it's, it's not only metaphorical, it's, it's literal. And you can soften the facial muscles and soften under the ears and at the back of the neck and the throat and the shoulders and down the arms to the hands and the fingers, the thumbs. The thumbs tend to grip higher a lot because you know, that's how we grip. Grip on to life. Well, there's no need to now because we're safe, just for a few moments anyway. Trust it. And um, the um, sides of your body soften down there, the armpits and all the way down your sides and your chest. Your chest can soften a lot more, a lot more. Solar plexus, that can always soften a thousand percent more. Just let that go as much as you possibly are willing. And down the back, the shoulder blade area and the mid back area where the kidneys are and so on. And the lower back area and the pelvic bowl, the buttocks and the pelvic floor sacral area, just the pubic bone, um, down the legs, the hamstrings and the quadriceps, the adductors, the abductors, the kneecaps, calves, shins, feet, toes, until the whole system, the musculoskeletal system, is softer, including all the way to your bone marrow. There's a sense of letting the bones even soften. Everything softens, the joints soften. Everything softens, even the organs soften, the blood vessels, the nerves, everything, everything manifests about you softens. Now this doesn't mean that you've gone slack because you're holding yourself lengthened and broadened. 
you have your dignity. Um, all it means is you stop gripping for no reason. Um, you're allowing your blood and your energy and your fluids to flow freely, which brings health, and health brings strength. So softening actually is the source of true strength. Now, having softened everything down and expanded everything, the big move is to shift backwards inside. Now, the front part of you is a lovely place to be. It's really exciting and it's noisy and tumultuous and unpredictable and, and it lurches from one feeling to the next and the mind in the front of the brain is just completely busy with debating and challenging and playing devil's advocate and having all kinds of conversations and crowd scenes and all the rest of it. And it is, it's really, really fascinating, riveting and compelling and it's a total not a waste of energy. Now, if you can um, get the feeling of leaning back into your shoulder blades and lean back into the front of your spine and lean back into your rear, rear pelvic bones and lean back into your sacral bone, just like you're leaning back into a really comfortable, well-designed chair. Or if you relate to racing drivers, you know, that kind of leaning back into that bucket seat in the racing car. Because you have a lot more command when you're in the back of you like this. The, the final touch of this is that if you, you don't have to make a big gesture, it's a tiny little gesture just to get your mind to feel it. You just tilt your head back a half a millimeter, it's just that. And imagining that the inside of the skull is a cave with a floor in it. And the mind, which is usually engrossed in the noise in the front, is obliged now to somehow slide backwards and until it's leaning up against the rear wall of the skull. A little bit like a Buddha with your face on it, and it is gazing into that void that is not empty, gazing into infinity. And infinity, which goes on forever and ever, and uh, as I was, didn't actually finish saying, the, the inner space, the Taoist suggested, was constructed in exactly the same way as outer space which is something I've heard our quantum physicists move lately as well. So this is really interesting because as you sit in the back of your head, gazing into the void that is not empty, you're actually really gazing into actual infinity in real life, just like the Tao, because you are the Tao in human form. And this hallowed and transcendent state uh, being the background presence within your skin, to whatever extent you're feeling it. Um, it the only danger of that is, is that it could make you feel slightly disassociated from your fellows. And any time we disassociate from our human family, not to mention all the other sentient beings, we are entering into a, you know, the beginning of a psychotic state, because we are interdependent almost one organism really um, and as I said at the beginning we need each other we need to gather like this so the way to antidote uh, any potential for that disassociation or alienation is to open the heart center um, because this connects you at a soul level now if you visualize the breastplate as comprising a pair of sliding doors and then see the doors open to the sides it will reveal at the core of your chest, not the, the, the heart organ, but the mystical heart, the heart center, the heart chakra. And you can visualize it as a beautiful rose emitting the most otherworldly, gorgeous fragrance without limit, um, without any clawback on it so that it's just free to radiate ubiquitously, infinitely. And while it radiates this fragrance, it also emits a rose-tinted golden light, a very discreet, subtle, almost opaque, but definite light, which spreads ubiquitously just like the fragrance. Now this is going on in the front of you. You can see it because you're sitting behind it. And there's this flower in the front. So you are not the flower. The flower is a symbol of your soul essence. And the fragrance and the light is representative of your beauty, your unique gorgeousness, that 
amazing quality that you came into the world with specifically to share and which got trammeled on and distorted and punched out of shape by people betraying you and being horrible to you and unjust to you and you being to them is, is part of the human experience and it's inevitable as a child which caused you, me and everyone else to close down the uh, flower and to stop the radiance occurring. But here we're safe to open it and let it radiate. So let your beauty, your unique gift to the world, which might have been hitherto somewhat compressed and occluded, now radiate freely for one and all. Simultaneously, make yourself available just by willing it so to receive the same from everybody in the circle here. So from all around the planet, every time zone, there's love coming to you and into your heart. And it's subtle, but it's beautiful. It's like silk, etheric silk. And simultaneously, as you breathe out, you're sharing your beautiful etheric silky love with everybody in here. And because our spirit is one of generosity, collectively and individually, um, this automatically, spontaneously spreads from us, from our circle, to everyone we know in our lives, and from them to everyone they know, and so on and so on, until exponentially it covers the entire face of the, of the world with this beautiful fragrant light, this love, and then love is, is healing. So here we are, this is where we are, we've set ourselves up. And um, the Taoists hold great store in the protective quality of the microcosmic orbit, the scooping of the loop. And so let's just do that to protect our spirits. We, we have this line of chi going up the rear of the spine from the coccyx at the base of the spine to the crown of the head. Um, then over the front of the brain and then down behind the face and along the frontal aspects of the spine, down to your perineum between your legs and then posterior to join up again with the coccyx and so form a, a loop of chi. The upward thrust of the chi going up the rear of your spine is the yang primordial yang or male energy and the downward thrust of the chi is the uh, primordial yin or the feminine. Now the, as you breathe in if you can focus on lighting up that channel going up the rear of the spine and as you do just feel yourself imbued with divine power, the power of the Tao, the power of the universe itself and as you breathe out light up the chi going down the front of the spine and Imbue that with divine grace, the grace of the Tao, that beautiful sense of serendipity and connectedness to all that is good. You breathe in and you've got the light going up your back and that's your power which protects you, directs you to the highest good. And then as you breathe out, that light goes down the front and that is the grace protecting you still but connecting you now to all that is good for you, for the good of everyone involved. Now that will have protected us or give us, given our consciousness an integrity so that when we make the jump now we won't leave any bits behind. Standing in front of you, see in, in front of you, visualize a mountain, however that looks to you, and make it a big one too, but one that could be almost impassable. And now this mountain has many nooks and crannies and valleys and bits and pieces all over it because you know mountains are just like a flat diagonal wall. They have all their own little world going on when you climb into them. And, and let all these valleys and rocks and juttings out and precipices and all the rest of it that comprise the mountain face um, be composed of the debris of like what's this, like millions of years of your complexes, of your insecurities, of your lack of self-belief, of the misinformed uh, beliefs, opinions that you have about yourself or have formed about yourself, that have probably buried, you know, and gone into denial about it because they're embarrassing to, to own up to, so you just shifted them to, to one side or buried them somewhere. You know, all the, the bits about you that don't believe you are a beautiful divine being, that somehow think that there's something you should be ashamed of, that you're somehow inferior, uh, that you haven't got what it takes, that you're bad or, that you're, you know, whatever it is, all that stuff the stuff that you feel guilty about, the stuff that you regret, the, the, the fears of shortfall and not being up to the mark and not achieving what it is you need to achieve or being a nobody, being unimportant, 
not being worthy of your society, um, the, the stuff you bought from uh, silly people telling you stuff that wasn't true, like when you were a kid and you were really having fun and some adult shouts, stop shutting off, stop being so conceited, or whatever it was that they told you. And that confusion that comes about, you want to be confident, but then maybe that's being conceited and you don't want to make people feel jealous of you or make them feel uncomfortable or you don't want to be ungracious, so maybe you shouldn't be confident, all that kind of stuff. That's what the mountain's made of. All your past apparent failures, all your past apparent humiliations, all your past apparent big mistakes, all that stuff, all the stuff that would get in the way of you feeling perfectly confident all the time, put that as what comprises the mountain. Now, the big jump comes. So this is the point where um, we are now imbued with a superhuman power that overrides the usual laws of physics. Just for this moment, we have this privilege. Um, for this, the purposes of this jump, we've each been granted the magical city power of being able to take a, just a relatively short run up and then with one leap and a bound, jump, almost like flying, right over the mountain, however high it is, doesn't matter, it can be as high as Mount Everest or twice the size of Mount Everest, you're able to jump right over it with one leap and land intact, gently, on the other side. And that when you do it, um, you'll actually feel the sensation of taking off what feels like almost vertically, um, moving upwards in a massive arc, going right over the peak. And even if you're a bit scared of heights, you'll feel such a thrill for doing it. Even though the air will be really thin up there, you'll just be so exhilarated, you won't mind. And then you'll actually be able to feel yourself going down the, the other side of the trajectory the, of, of the arc and landing with the supreme grace on both feet, on the other side, perfectly intact, without even an ache in your knees. So if you're ready, walk away from the mountain, turn around away from it, and step back as far as you feel you need to, to get a good run up. And then turn back, face the mountain, look at it, know that this mountain comprises all the factors that have been blocking you from having absolute confidence, and then take a run up and bounce off that strong foot and feel yourself take off like a bird. You're just shooting straight up in the sky like a human rocket and you're going right over the mountain, right over the ridge, right over the peak and then sailing down the other side and it's beautiful. It's so exhilarating you want this to go on forever. And then bang, you've landed on the other side, gently, beautifully, mysteriously managed to land almost with no weight at all. Um, knees are flexible, you don't feel any ache, no jarring, no shock in the body, bang, you're back. And you turn around and you look at the mountain and you think, I just jumped over that. I just jumped right over that mountain. All that mountain of lack of self-belief, all that mountain of lack of confidence, of inferiority complex and all the rest of it. I've just jumped right over that and now I'm standing on the other side. Then turn away from the mountain and take stock, straighten up, take stock, breathe a bit slowly, get a feeling of what's going on in your body, shift right back inside so you can really feel it. You're in command of everything. Let it all settle down, let all the energy settle. And then visualize yourself looking absolutely confident, unshakable, and unperturb imperturbable, undaunted by anything. So pretty much invincible. See yourself having the kind of face that somebody has when they are that. It's human, it has compassion, it's vulnerable, it has flexibility to it. It's human, it's not a, 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 like a stiff thing. It's not a bravery, it's a deep, beautiful confidence that is fully, fully surrendered to whatever destiny brings and has absolute trust in life being supremely benign and absolute trust in themselves for being able to ride life optimally from now on, no matter what.
knowing that by being this way, life will reward you um, by becoming a lot easier for you and bringing you the things that you need much more swiftly and elegantly than ever before. See yourself as that person. See the smile. See the eyes. See the lines at the sides of the eyes. See the shape of the mouth. See the nose. See the, the set of the head, the way it's held. See the shoulders. See the arms. See the hands. See the legs. See the feet. See that body. See that face smiling back at you. Somehow magically being able to smile right through the mountain at you in your present state and reassuring you, it's going to be all right. You're, going, you're this. This is you. This is you. This is you now. Now, very deftly, draw that being into your physical body right here, right now. Let go of the whole mountain scenery and all the rest of it. And here you are in your body, here and now, this Sunday evening or whatever time it is for you, on this day on the planet Earth. And you are feeling that inside you. You can feel those lines in the sides of your eyes, those lines that come, I'm not suggesting you're wrinkled, but those lines that portray uh, supreme confidence and trust in the most beautiful, humble, modest, surrendered way. True, true confidence. You can feel free to borrow my dark blue marble from whatever you want to use. You might have one of your own, some symbol that you might want to use, but the dark blue marble's up for grabs if you want it, and put it in your solar plexus and let it, let it spin whichever way it wants to in there. And just know that that is your confidence. That's the symbol of your confidence. And it's okay. Everything's going to be okay. There's no big drama about it. Nothing melodramatic about any of this. It's very discreet, very subtle. And you're in the back of you where nothing can touch you. The front part of you, the constructive part of you, is only an illusion which will fall away at death anyway. So just honor it, have compassion for it, bless it, and know that that's irrelevant. You in your back is the real you. This is the big presence with this lovely ball of confidence in the solar plexus. Heart wide open, that beautiful flower, that rose, exuding your love, receiving the love of everybody. You stand in good relation to all your fellows. You stand in good relation to the Tao. You stand in good relation to the planet. You stand in good relation to the entire environment. You stand in good relation to existence. Everything is as it is meant to be in this moment. Now, there are 7 billion people or a bit more than that on this planet right now, most of whom, in fact I say all of whom are suffering to various degrees, some a lot more than others. Let's share this beautiful sensation of being together in this state with everybody somehow, just intend it, I don't know how that looks, but visualize the rose gold vapor, sweet smelling fragrance move like a blanket to cover the entire face of the earth and touch every single person and every single animal and living creature everywhere and that it be so powerful that it even radiates throughout space and touches all sentient beings throughout the multiverse and the sense that the entire multiverse, this one presence is just going, mm -hmm, thank you. And on that note, wriggle your toes, wriggle your nose, wriggle your fingers and start to bring yourself um, back into the so-called waking everyday state. Open your eyes and if you have questions or comments, this is the moment to put them to us. I hand over to Sue to explain what to do. Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we have got a few questions in already and I'll mm -hmm. start with this one from Jennifer in Australia. Yeah. My, work, my role at work has been dramatically changed. How can I feel confident amidst all this uncertainty? Um, hi, Jennifer. The, the, um, you know, like we invest in, in the external world in, in various reference points as being reliable. Um, but everything manifests as in motion. I mean, the entire universe is comprised of moving parts. So nothing is, is, is ever going to remain stable. Now, what's driving this change? Uh, well, no, let me go back a bit. The, one of the things, we, nobody can say reality is this or reality is that, because it's all subjective and relative. Um, but what the Taoists suggest is or propose is that the life, Tao, whatever you want to call it, works like a mirror. And it will respond to whatever you believe it to be by being that for you. Um, that's the essence of this magic, really. So if you believe, if you tell yourself a story that this presence is benign, 
and that everything it does, it does for your good. And occasionally that would be a bit painful, like ripping off a plaster, a sticky plaster, um, or, or whatever. But the, the moment of, of pain or discomfort or disorientation will be worth it, because after that will come um, deliverance into the, bit, into the new fresh green pastures. If you tell yourself that story, that's how it will be. So this isn't a matter of having faith of like God is good or anything like that, which is nothing wrong with that, it's lovely, but um, this is uh, just knowing that the universe mirrors back at you whatever you believe it to be, it's as simple as that. So if you, if you believe that the Tao is a benign fairy godmother kind of character, which of course this is just symbolic, um, it will be that for you and it will guide you to more and more self-realization, fulfillment, satisfaction, joy, abundance and everything that you need to feed your soul. Um, so to trust these weird things that happen, work, things being changed on you, I mean this is happening to so many including me, I mean everybody's kind of work environment is shifting dramatically at the moment, that's part of what's going on. But to trust that it's leading somewhere good, that's the key. Just be willing to trust it because that's what confidence means. And for me that process starts with facing the opposite and being okay with that as well. So say say what it does, this doesn't actually need somewhere nice. Say it turns to a load of shit. And um, I, am I going to let that stop my delight in being alive? No. Even if it comes the worst thing I can imagine, I'm still going to love being here. I That's my vow. I'm going to love this for whatever. Take some pluck, take some courage, but I'm going to do it. Once I face that and I've accepted that, then I can turn myself to saying, actually though, my intention is for this to lead to the best, and it will, and it does. It's just a matter of riding the roller coaster till, it, till you arrive there. And that is much easier done when you place yourself in the back of you, because there, there's no drama. There, it doesn't mind what you go through. It's just fascinated by being alive. And that's really the key. Stay in the back, relax as much as you can. Remember to do that as often as you can, and you'll notice that the, the drama levels will decrease until they're not really interfering with you anymore. And by the time you've mastered that, you'll find things will have worked out anyway for you. And I know they will. They will. You'll be fine. I see that. This next one is from Ross. Would true spontaneous self-confidence be understandable or even possible without a deep trust in Tao? Uh, hi Ross, nice to hear from you. No, it wouldn't, I think. I, I don't think it is possible. But that doesn't mean it has to be a cognitive awareness of, of Tao, because everybody knows they are Tao really, you know, underneath all the noise of the surface mind. So it could be somebody who's completely unaware, but they just are naturally somehow trusting of the presence without even being able to define it as that. So it's not necessary that it has to be cognitive, but it certainly helps. And um, I think it would be impossible to have any kind of confidence if you were just stuck in the belief that the individuated, constructed self, the ego, was all there was, because then it's a very shaky place to be. There's no real foundation to it. And their confidence is not possible, only arrogance, really, uh, that sort of bipolar effect. Um, yeah, so you're, you're spot on. Confidence is only possible when you are fully aware of the big presence. This next one is from Grace, who says, I'm confused. How do you know the Tao is in the back of you? If it's chi, I thought it should be everywhere. Um, <laughs> hi, Grace. I love the name Grace. Um, well, the Tao isn't only in the back of you, it's everywhere. I mean, this is all Tao. Everything's Tao and everything is chi. The chi is the Tao made manifest. Um, the material, as Fritjof Capra says, is, is a glitch in the, in the, uh, in the chi. Um, when we're in a human body, you have choice of where to situate yourself within your skin. Um, if you do nothing about it, your default to being in the front of your body. The reason being is that your sense organs perceive reality occurring in front of you. And reality is fascinating. As well as that, your reactions to reality, your emotions, your thoughts, is also fascinating. It's what I call theatre or drama. Now, when you are in the front of you, because you've been pulled forwards to to meet with the fascination, you're lost in the drama. You're still chi, you're still the Tao, but you're not aware of it. You're caught in the drama, you're caught in the illusion, you're caught in what the Tao is called the world of the 10,000 things. However, 
when you sink into the back of you, which is your prerogative to do, there's no law that says you have to be in the front of you where all that noise is. When you sink into the back of you, it's quiet. There's no noise in the back. You know, there's no peristaltic motion. There's no heartbeat. There's no noise of the lungs. There's no digestive noises. There's no emotional conflict that you get in the solar plexus, for example. There's no thinking, uh, oh, should I do this, should I do that, should I have done this, should I have done that stuff going on. It's perfectly silent and it's strong. Unlike the front, which is vulnerable and relatively weak, the back is strong and relatively protective. When you situate yourself in the back, you are in a place of stillness and silence within. And that enables you to appreciate what's really going on. When you um, uh, sit in your back, you become one with that aspect of you that bears witness to your life unfolding. You know, like Grace, when you were born and you crunched through the birth canal, as you need an have a caesarean birth, um, the part, there was a part of you observing that happening. So as the front part was going, whoa, this is a real squish, the part of you that's the presence was observing, going, ha ha, fascinating, another being born episode. As you went to kindergarten and you had to say bye to your mum, assuming that was you know, as, uh, you know, difficult, which it is for most kids making that transition, that first moment. No matter what stuff the kid was going through in the front of the body, that there was something watching it from behind, bearing witness to it, and so on and so forth, through all the phases of your life, there was this presence watching. So you can call that the background presence. Now that's the Tao in repose, if you like, rather than the Tao being caught up in loads of action. It's just watching, it's fascinated, it's delighted, it's curious, it's riveted by just the simple fact of existence, which isn't actually that simple, it's a miracle. And that is in the back. It's really that simple, it's that. But I hope that would clarify things somewhat for you. But if not, we can discuss it further in the future at the time. Okay, we've got a couple of comments in um, and some more questions. Uh, Sarah in Houston says, thank you for a wonderful satsang and have an awesome week. Thank you, sorry. You too. It was beautiful, wasn't it? I loved it today. Bless you. And Sieglinda says, there are no words to describe my gratefulness for what you do, so I simply say thank you again. Oh, Sieglinda, that will do for me. I got that. Thank you. You're welcome. Penny's question is, how can I shake off the old self-image of victim after losing my job and reinventing myself in a small community? Um, well, you know, we could go into this in, in, in great depth, but using the technique that we just did, that jumping over, you could set up your, uh, the victim thing as a, a little hill in front of you. You could even see it with victim written on it. And it looks impassable, but you go, no, fuck it, I'm going to jump right over that. Then you just see yourself jump over it. You land on the other side, and you go, right, I've jumped over that. If you repeat that in your mind, a few times, you will find that you've jumped over it. Now, there'll always be the, the latent tendency to see ourselves, to, to succumb to self-pity and that victim mode. That's just part of the human range. But there's always an option, and that's really the, the key here, to know that there's always the option. And you exercise the option by enacting little internal rituals like the jumping uh, visualization. So you see yourself jump over the victim hill or mountain or whatever and be on the other side and go, right, I've jumped over that. And you just keep doing that, doing it, doing it. And at a certain point in time, you'll look back in reality and go, yeah, you know, I've done that. I'm no longer succumbing to that victim thing. It's boring. I think that would be my answer in a nutshell. Lisa's question is, if an experience is tricky, it starts to induce panic. Do you have any emergency tips to use in that situation? Yeah, Lisa, the, um, to preclude panic coming on, um, look, first of all, get that thing of dropping into the back. That's very important. That's most important because then there isn't the drama of the panic. You know, you're in the back and you're, okay, look, I'm seeing what's going on here. There's this panic thing going on in the front of me. The next thing is if you can catch it, to stop holding your breath and breathe slowly. Even if it makes you feel a bit dizzy, just breathe slowly. And that means slowly, not quickly. And as quietly as possible. Try to keep it not like that. Don't do all that stuff. Just really silken, quiet breathing. Because that immediately calms the mind. But this is the one that will really do the magic. If you look at your palm, look at your right palm, and you look at your little finger, and you 
trace the line of the little finger down along the edge of the palm until you it intersects with the wrist bracelet, you know, that band that goes around the uh, base of the palm. Now, in line with the little finger, if you sort of close and open your fist a little bit, you'll see there's a, a tendon um, running up the edge of the forearm, the soft side of the forearm, that leads into the bone of the palm in line with the little finger. If you use the fingers of the other hand, or a finger of the other hand, to kind of rub up that tendon until you meet the bone of the palm using some pressure, and uh, it should make your little finger go a bit numb or tingly when you do it. And then you do the same on the other side. You might want to look this up on Google. There's an acupressure point. It's heart seven, the seventh point on the heart meridian, known poetically as the spirit door. Now, if you massage this firmly with a finger or thumb of the other hand and then do the same on both or on the other hand as well, um, within 10 minutes maximum, so often way quicker, it's the same effect as taking about 2.5 to 3 milligrams of Valium. It just completely calms you down, but it's good for you. It's also great if you can't sleep as well. So just that's it. You drop right back inside, so become the watcher rather than the person lost in the drama of the panic. Slow the breathing down. Don't hold the breath. That's really, really crucial. Get the breathing slowed down, and as you do that, press this point and wait three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, or whatever, without freaking out too much, and you'll notice you calm right down. Everything will be fine. And also visualizing yourself looking calm, even if you don't believe. I have to tell you, this visualization business is not about convincing yourself. You don't believe it. It's not, you're not trying to go, yeah, that's me jumping over the thing. I believe I'm that guy. I can do that. It's really not that. There's no energy expended like that. It's just like I say to you, picture a purple elephant with green spots on it. You can see it. It's stupid. We know there are no naturally born elephants who are purple with green spots on. Nonetheless, we can see it. We can visualize it. And it's exactly the same with this. All you have to do is see yourself jumping over. Um, and so you could put a hill in front of you made of panic and see yourself jump right over it and be on the other side of it and go, all right, I've jumped over that now. I don't have to worry about panic anymore. I've jumped over it. And you just keep doing that. It does work. It does work. Um, should we have this as the last question? Funny you should say that. <laughs> I was just going to say, everybody's <laughs> being very, uh, very shy. There are no hands raised. So I just have one more question. This is another one from Ross. How can one mistrust oneself when that would be absurd, since how then can you trust your doubt? <laughs> um, um, how do you mistrust yourself? Well, it's easy. You know that how easy it is to learn to mistrust yourself. It's a ruse, actually. It's a, it's good. You, you ask really good questions, Ross, as you know. Um, it's like I, I noticed that there's this thing that I do where I don't, I try, I don't have actually done it for a while now, but I, I picked it up, I think when I was in my either late teens or early 20s, where I was with somebody that I didn't want to make them feel like they were being, they, they were really being stupid, and I didn't want to make them feel they were being stupid, or that I was smarter than them or something, so I made myself be stupid, like, with them, and, and like, ooh, as, like, I, like I banged into a wall, and I, ooh, like that, like I was a complete twat, and actually I didn't really feel that, I did it somehow to make them feel okay, I can't explain it, and I noticed that stuck with me, and every now and again I'd do this silly thing where I'd be pretending to be a twat when I wasn't actually being one, um, and I think that's how it works, we delude ourselves into not trusting ourselves, I don't think it's natural, that's the interesting thing about it, I think we actually collude with some aspects of ourselves to create this false construct of non-trust, so that's how we do it, the same way as all illusions are, are, are created. I mean, you know, look, think of all the lies that go on in the world, the amazing amount of lies uh, that are occurring in, in the world. That, that's not natural. That isn't natural. It's unnatural. But it happens. So it's like this game occurs where we create this unnatural reality, or this fake reality, which is comprised of lies. And that not trusting the self is one of them. It's a lie. Because the real self, there's no issue of trust. There's no issue of confidence. It just is. Confident. It is trust, because why would it not be? There's no reason for it not to be. And I think that's a really good place to be. There's no reason for anybody in this satsang uh, this evening or at the time it is for you to not trust yourself and to not be confident. You have just every reason to naturally be the confident, beautiful, amazing, magnificent, stupendous, spectacular miracle of existence that you are. And I wish you, with all my heart this week, that everywhere you go, 
every thought you have sparks off a thousand and eight beautiful occurrences for all of the people around you which bounce back on you multiplied by a hundred at least so that by the time we meet again assuming you come next week which I really really hope you do you will be so almost overwhelmed with blessings that you'll need like a warehouse um, to rent to stick them all in that's my wish for you and that the warehouse actually comes for free all right lots of love and I will see you next week all being well bless you bye bye